book of Matthew, chapter 16. Let's begin with prayer. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for tonight. Thank you for bringing us all together once again by your grace. We ask you to bless the service, the ministering, and the learning of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Matthew in the 16th chapter, I'm going to take part of verse number 18. Jesus speaking. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The word prevail to win. The gates of hell will not win against my church, Jesus says. I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Our title tonight, The Church Jesus is Building. Now, throughout this message, when I use the word church, I'm not always talking about our church. Everyone who has been born again, faith in Jesus, and are learning and obeying Him as they learn, everywhere in the world, are part of the church across the world, the body of Christ. Everyone who's born again, saved, and living for God in the power of God, learning how to live for Him and obeying Him from their heart, everywhere in the world, they're part of what is called the worldwide church. So you have a local church like us, but we're a part of the whole church across the world, also called the body of Jesus Christ. And so tonight when I use the word church, I'm not only talking about our church, I'm talking about the whole church everywhere. If someone in Africa is serving the Lord in spirit and in truth, they are part of the same church that we're part of. If someone in Japan or China or Thailand or America or Russia or Ukraine, if they're serving God according to the word of God, then they are in the same church that we're in right now, though they're in a different country. This is why you can travel to different countries. If you meet someone who really is a Christian, you immediately have a connection to them. I mean, in your heart, you have a connection to them. The world may tell you you're supposed to hate that person, but because you're, you're serving Jesus and they're serving Jesus in their country, if you meet somewhere, you can meet them on a boat out in the middle of the ocean. You will connect with them immediately because you have one thing in common, and that is you are both serving the same Jesus. So that's what I'm going to talk about tonight is the church that Jesus, the church Jesus is building. In this message, we're going to speak about some things that will speak to all of us no matter where we are in our relationship with God, and no matter what our calling in God is. Now, whenever Jesus here in Matthew 16, whenever he's telling Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, he's talking about the revelation that Peter received from God the Father. What revelation? That Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of the whole world to those who come to Him. Jesus is telling Peter, upon the truth that you just spoke, that I am the Son of God, that I am the Lord, that I am the Savior, that I am the Messiah. Upon that truth, the church across the whole world will be built, will be built. 
knowing that every one of us have a part in this worldwide church, the structure of it, the quality of it, in great part, is dependent upon the structure and quality of our relationship with God. Now, Jesus can do a lot for us, but he will not do everything for us. And we have to be willing to be part of that church, on and on. And so the first thing we're going to talk about tonight on this, about this church that Jesus is building, we're going to talk about the structure of it. The structure of it. All buildings like this one need a foundation and they need walls to, to give structure. And then there has to be a roof on top. If the building is big enough, this one is not, but if it's big enough, you'll have these pillars every so often to help hold up the building. Jesus is building a church. And in the church that Jesus is building has structure. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11 through 12. We'll start with this. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. Now we refer to Ephesians 4, chapter 4, verse 11. We refer to that as the fivefold ministry. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. The, the fivefold ministry, verse 12. Here's the reason he gives these ministers. For the perfecting of the saints. He gives them for three reasons here, okay? The perfecting of the saints. The minister's job is to perfect you. That means make you better than you were before by teaching and prayer and guidance. We'll get to more of that in a moment. For the perfecting of the saints, and whenever the saints, the Christians, are growing, the second part is for the work of the ministry. That means the minister's job is to educate and make the Christians better so that the Christians join the minister in the ministry. Okay? And so part of that would be taking care of the house of God, financially cleaning, think bringing food to fellowship, things like that, that's fine. But also inviting people to this church that, so that they can learn how to join the big church across the world. By, by being saved. And then the third part, for the edifying of the body of Christ, is Ephesians 4, verse 12. Whenever the Christians are perfected, that's you, whenever you get better and you join in ministry together with the minister, then the whole church across the world gets better. He calls it the body of Christ. And so therefore, the first part of the structure of Jesus' church, I'm not just talking about this church, the whole worldwide church, is it has structure. And the structure is set up by the ministers he just mentioned in Ephesians chapter 4. The role of the apostle is to establish as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, to establish governments, governments in a church and in the worldwide church. Okay, So when I speak of governments, I'm not talking about the city hall, Korean city hall or the embassy or the capital or anything. I'm talking about structure within the church Jesus is building. He sets up, the apostle sets up governments within the structure of this entity called the church under the leadership of, as, as Paul says in Hebrews 3 and 1, 
our apostle and high priest of our profession, Christ Jesus. That means Jesus is the chief apostle of all apostles. Okay, So the apostle, remember Ephesians chapter 4, apostle, uh, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher. The apostle sets up the structure, the government under the apostle Christ Jesus. They also raise up leaders to lead and develop others into disciples within that structure. Many people don't want to believe that church is supposed to have structure. But that's because they don't have structure in their thinking. They want to be here, there, and everywhere, and nowhere at the same time. And usually they end up nowhere. Structure does not mean dictatorship, but it does need to be there. So the apostle does what? Sets up governments, meaning the structure, the governing of the bot of the church, etc., Raises up leaders to go out and lead and develop others into disciples. They, they also oversee that the church functions as effectively as possible to accomplish the goal it was be, that is being built to accomplish. What did, that, what did Jesus say? I will build my church. Remember Matthew? Jesus said what? I will build my church. Jesus right now is trying to build his church by teaching us. So the apostle says of governments, leaders, leadership, trains leaders to go out and disciple, develop others. They oversee the functions to function as effectively as possible to accomplish the goal the church is being built to accomplish, which is reaching men and women for Jesus Christ. Amen. That is what this local church is about. That is what the worldwide church is about. The goal is to reach men and women for Jesus Christ and then develop them into disciples. Followers with discipline is what a disciple is. The church's calling and goal is not to be a customer care center. That is not what the church is supposed to be. It is not a location of free stuff to people who only want free stuff. That is not what the church is about. It may serve as a location, but it does not provide to an, a lost community things that they're only there to get. It is there to accomplish the goal of reaching men and women for, for Christ. And in the book of Romans, Paul says that we do this through preaching. Amen. Preaching is what reaches people. Preaching the word of God. Not some diluted version, half verses posted online. Preaching the whole Bible. Amen. Next, let's talk about the prophet because we're still talking about structure. The role of the prophet is to declare a message of comfort or warning. Whether it be a present message or a message of future events. A prophet is not called by God to give you your lucky lottery numbers or whatever makes you rich. It is to declare a present or a present message of comfort or a message of future warning, of future events. Most messages of the future that prophets spoke were messages of warning so as to prepare the people. Read about Isaiah, Ezekiel, Elijah, all the rest. They were prophesying about future events, Daniel, etc. And they were messages of warning. The role of the evangelist is to gather and encourage people to continue serving the Lord and fighting the good fight of faith. The role of the pastor is to shepherd God's people through the passages and pathways of this wilderness all the way to heaven. That's the role of the pastor, to shepherd people through the passage, passages and pathways of this life, ultimately to get you to heaven. That's what a pastor is supposed to do. The role of the teacher is to ground God's people in the Word. 
the word as it is written, not as it fits into current day acceptance. Okay? So in, a, in, in Ephesians 4, he says the pastor and teacher. So a pastor is not only to shepherd and lead and guide God's people all the way to heaven, and that may mean that may mean uh, encouraging you and giving you some energy and encouraging you with the word and feeding you with the word. It may also mean grabbing you by the back of your neck, so to speak, and pulling you away from the wolves. Right? Sometimes Christians like to go out chasing the wolves. Here I am. I'm a sheep. Eat me. Eat me. I'm a sheep. Here I am. The pastor as a shepherd has to grab them and pull them back. All right. Not literally, but warning them. Amen. There are people who just like to chase dysfunction. They are always chasing what they should not be chasing. Amen. It reminds me of, a, of a, something I read recently. There was a man who told his daughter, he said, she's probably in her 20s. He said, you need to become a police officer. She said, I don't want to be a police officer. He said, well, you're chasing the same people they chase. You may as well get paid for it. <laughs> you may as well get paid for it. <laughs> All right. Let me take a sip of water. And of course, she probably said, uh uh. All right. <laughs> Anything that is functional must first be structural. And the reason that God sets up offices and governing bodies in his church across the world and locally is because he is building something that's meant to be functional. God, Jesus is building a worldwide church. And by doing that, he's building little churches like us all around the world. But he's not building it to just be a party center. He's building it to be something functional. And in order to, for it to be functional, it must have structure. Men. He's building a church that had never existed before. The church that Jesus is building is made up of, guess what? People. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We are the church. Not this building. You and me, we're the church. And so Jesus is building a church that had never existed before. And if this church was going to be built, it would have to be built, or if this church was going to exist, it would have to be built by Jesus. And he's building it right now. Therefore, he said what? I will build it. I will build it. Jesus is building something that is meant to do something and last forever. Amen. The church is not meant to just go to church, all right? That is not what we're supposed to do, just go to church. That's not what we're supposed to do. Jesus is building a church out of you and out of me, a church. He's building something to do something, a church to be a church, a church to win the world and win the lost and bring people to Jesus. So Jesus is building something that is meant to do something. Thank God for that. I believe it's Peter that says we are like lively stones. We are lively stones. God's church is not meant to be a place where you cannot tell the difference between, a church, between the church and the world. If this church is not built, listen to this, if this church is not built by following the leading of Jesus, it will evolve into something it was never meant to be. It may call itself a church, but it will evolve into something it was never meant to be. This is why a lot of churches have become nothing more than customer emotional care centers, and that's it. Make people feel happy and welcome, and they're no better when they leave than they were when they came in. The church is meant to do something. Amen. That means you and I were meant to do something. Invite someone to church. It'll become a hybrid of some sort. Part church, part world. 
It'll start letting worldly dress in, worldly music in, promotional videos with worldly music, and you won't be able to tell the difference. And it allows it under the guise of not wanting to offend someone. We have people who do things in the church here, and there's people who talk, or at least one person, uh, no, a couple people who do creative things for the church, whether it be slides or music or things. And all of them know that I have the right to change it or cancel it. Okay? Amen. Whether they're developing slides for the church or whether they're bringing out music for the church or one person is talking about developing a promotional video, every one of them know I have the right to change something or cancel it. Change the picture, change the words, change the colors, or say no altogether. Because we do not want our church to become, to evolve into a hybrid of part church, part world. Amen. If we're not following the leading of Jesus, then the church that calls itself a church will evolve into something it was never meant to be. It'll talk about God while looking, acting, and speaking like the world, and you won't be able to tell the difference between the two. You won't be able to tell the difference between the two. It's like the story of that young man who didn't feel welcome in the church. So he went outside, sat on the curb, and started crying. Not here. This is just a story. <laughs> Not in this church. He was somewhere. He was, went to a church somewhere, and they didn't make him feel welcome. And so he's out there on the curb crying. And then Jesus walks up to him. Just a story. Jesus walks up to him and says, what are you crying for? He said, well, I don't feel welcome in that church. He said, I don't either. <laughs> Jesus said, I, I'm not welcome in that church either. But it called itself a church, I'm sure. For people to say they do not believe in organized religion, it is interesting. It is interesting that they will quickly obey the authorities of an organized military. They will obey that organized organization quickly. They'll wear what they're told and not call it legalistic. They'll wear the same uniform every single day and not call it legalistic because it brings in the money. They will obey an organized society such as police officers. Most of them will pull over when they're told to pay the tickets they're given. They will obey an organized school for their children. They're going to put their child in the class they're told to, with the teacher they're told to, and they're going to buy the supplies that are on the list. They... Um, They'll buy the right uniform for their kids. If their school requires a uniform, they'll buy the right uniform for their kids and not call it legalistic. <laughs> they will obey an organized college because they want that degree. This, they say this is, a, this, is the, uh, the, uh, this is the process through which you have to go to get into our college. This is the program you have to follow to get this many credits, to get this degree. They'll obey that organized system. And all these things should be done in their proper places. Amen. They should be. But they will not obey the structure that God has set up for His worldwide church. The real reason it is easier for many people to respect and obey the authorities of organized entities of this world is because it serves their personal purposes. That's why. They'll obey the military because the military brings in money. They'll obey their boss at work because it brings in money. They'll obey what the school says because it gets that education done. They'll obey whatever because it's about their personal goals. The reason many of them do not, quote, do not like structured religion is because God deals with the rebellion in their hearts. A college is not going to deal with rebellion in your heart. A police officer is not going to deal with rebellion in your heart unless you try to rebel. 
The military won't deal with rebellion in your heart. As a matter of fact, you can be in the military or be at his job or go to college or even interact with police. You can even be a police officer. Have rebellion in your heart as long as you don't act it out. You can actually be very successful in life. But God not, doesn't just deal with rebellion in actions. He, re, he deals with rebellion in the heart, lust in the heart, hatred in the heart, anger in the heart, refusal in the heart, whatever it may be. As John Baptist says, the ax is laid to the roots of the tree of your problems. 1 Corinthians 12, 28, God had set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, Miracles, gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. That was 1 Corinthians 12, 28. He's speaking there that God has set things in a certain order. And those who will not serve God according to the structure of God, this isn't just a local church, listen to me. No, no, no. The whole worldwide church, everywhere you go, if you're going to obey the Bible, then we must Follow Jesus according to the structure he has established. Amen. Another reason for structure, and here's another reason many people don't like it, is that it offers guidance. Now here's, the, here's the benefits, but here's the reason some people don't like it, but they are benefits. Another reason for structure, even in the things of God, is that structure offers guidance accountability, responsibility, and integrity. You see, when you have a structure and you have in the, in the church of God, in the body of Christ, when you have apostles over you, when you have prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, those who are keeping you accountable, that's another reason people don't like it. They don't want to be held accountable. They don't want to have to have integrity. They want to disappear into the sunset and then change what they were taught. All right? And the sunset can just be right down the street from the church. It doesn't have to be that far away. And so many people, they do not want responsibility. They do not want accountability. They do not want to have to have integrity. But Jesus, the great apostle and high priest of our profession, he sees you and me. He knows you and me. He knows what's in the heart everywhere we go. Amen. You cannot get away from Jesus. So another reason many people do not like structure, but it's good for us. It offers all these things. The question is, why would someone not want these benefits? It goes back to selfishness. We're almost finished here. As people, okay, one more thing about the church that Jesus is building. As people, we need visible authority. We need visible authority. This is why a lot of people love following online churches but they do not go to a local church. Now we stream online. We, have, we are streaming online. But we are supposed to be going physically to a church. Hebrews chapter 10 tells us that. But the reason many people will only follow online church is because the pastor of the online church, are you following me now? Are you listening the pastor of the online church doesn't know them, doesn't know how they're living, and cannot observe them and get a word from God to impart to them. They love that. As people, we need visible authorities. Otherwise, we do not do well being a law to ourselves. Amen. We do not do well being a law to ourselves. The Bible says in the book of Judges, chapter 17, verse 6, 
It says, every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But the beginning of that verse says this, in those days there was no king in Israel. Not even God was their king. They were not letting him be their king. So in those days, there was no king. In other words, there was no one to hold them accountable. So what did they do? That which was right in their own eyes. That was Judges chapter 17, the Old Testament book of Judges chapter 17. And just two chapters later, you read about a woman who got raped to death and cut in pieces. Her body was cut in pieces. Judges chapter 19. We need visible authority. Amen. Trying to live life on our own terms, we may survive. But God has not called us to just survive. Amen. God wants you to thrive in God. He doesn't want you just barely scratching, barely scraping. I don't know if I can make it another five minutes. He doesn't want you just to survive. He wants to empower you with love and the power of God so that you can thrive in God. But the only way to thrive in God is to fall within the structure of the church Jesus is building. That's for you and me, by the way. All right? We don't outgrow this. We don't get to a point where we, I don't need to listen to that anymore. We don't outgrow this. Just for me, can you come on to the music, please? Get ready. <clears throat> we need visible authorities. You need a pastor watching over your soul as one who must give account. 